now we're moving on to our final speaker for the day, Dr. Andrea Bonham-Blanc, who is CEO and founder of GEC Risk Advisory and a global governance, risk, ethics, cyber, and crisis strategist serving business, nonprofits, and governments. Good morning, Andrea, and welcome. Well, actually, uh, we're way into the afternoon here. I'm way behind schedule. <laughs> yeah, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> <laughs> we're very glad you could join us and take it away. Likewise, thank you so much, Paul, and thank you, Peter, for inviting me in the first place. And this has been a real whirlwind of great perspectives and trends, both micro and macro. And so I'll just um, position where I'm coming from to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, so you see the title is ESG to ESG and T. And so just, just when we thought we, we couldn't cope with enough uh, acronyms and uh, shorthand and longhand uh, ways of looking at, at this topic of sustainability, impact investing and ESG, uh, here I come with my ESG plus T. So uh, uh, I really see it more as a mega trend kind of a discussion. Uh, we're talking about how certainly in the last few years, but most certainly in the last few months with COVID, um, the whole area has really exploded in relevance because we've been able to finally convince, I think, people uh, who were on the fence or who didn't really think it was central uh, to economic or social or political welfare uh, to deal with these issues. Uh, we, we were finally, through COVID, sadly, um, seeing an explosion of interest and uh, I think uh, long-term interest because as um, the prior speaker just said, uh, millennials are very focused on this and so are other generations, but especially I think the younger generations are going to take this over the hump, only, not only because they, they seem to have their, their um, you know, heads screwed on right, but they also uh, live in a time where all of this has become very, very highly relevant. So let me just um, explain what I mean by ESG plus T. So as everybody knows, environmental, social, and governance issues, um, uh, whichever way you, you slice them, um, are central to how we do business, how we uh, develop strategy, how uh, we, we do anything uh, in, through any organization. So my perspective, having been uh, for many years a, a corporate executive who was in charge of uh, environmental health and safety, legal, corporate responsibility, risk management, and crisis management, um, for many years, uh, it was always difficult to convince the hardcore business people that it was relevant to talk about these issues. And sometimes it, you had to wait for a scandal, you had to wait for a crisis to basically say, see, we need to think about these environmental issues or these social equity issues or these governance, uh, anti-corruption, anti-money laundering issues, whatever issues they were. So now we have this sort of perfect storm that's come together of ESG issues. Um, as Peter very eloquently uh, said at the very beginning of our session today, um, the whole uh, environmental piece and, and pandemic piece or biological piece are totally interconnected and they're also interconnected with the social piece, uh, which is also interconnected with the governance piece. But I would just posit to uh, everybody who's willing to listen that we live in the fourth industrial revolution. And that means that technology is everywhere, every second of the day. It's here today on this Zoom. Um, it, it affects us in everything that we do. And so ESG, I think, has not uh, properly addressed all of the new issues, risks, and opportunities that come uh, with, with the fact that technology is enabling us to do all kinds of things, and it is also threatening us in all kinds of ways. Um, and, you know, technology issues can range from cyber attacks to AI uh, being used in software. We heard about a couple of software programs earlier that are driven by algorithms. Um, we have all kinds of biological issues uh, that are driven uh, or enabled by technology. So we're dealing with, uh, you know, how does an organization, whether you're a business entity, whether you are a nonprofit, a startup, a university, even a government agency, how are the leaders of those organizations thinking about how to know about their ESG plus T issues, uh, know about which ones are risks that could be material risks, 
and also know about the opportunities. And my uh, theory, which I, I've developed through a book that I recently wrote called Bloom to Boom, How Leaders Transform Risk into Resilience and Value, I actually have a chapter for each of the four categories of ESGNT and try to sort of dissect um, through each of those chapters, what is, does environment mean? What are the typologies? What are the issues? Using, of course, uh, very well-established sources like the World Economic Forum and the UN um, uh, SDGs and many others, the Cambridge um, uh, Institute on, uh, on um, what's it called, uh, extreme risk, et cetera, et cetera. So looking at environmental issues, social issues, governance issues, and technology issues. And my whole point here is that we need to get executive teams, boards of directors, um, you know, oversight uh, bodies, if it's a government or a university institution, to think holistically of ESG and T issues as part of their uh, business strategy. And everybody has a business strategy, whether you're a nonprofit or a um, for-profit or, or some other kind of entity, like a government agency or an international organization. And I've worked with clients around the world who are each of those categories, for-profits, um, nonprofits, and also uh, international agencies within the UN system, for example, or an international financial institution in another part of the world. And each of them have um, latched on to some of these issues. And the idea really is to, to get them to think holistically about these issues. Because if you don't, uh, one of the key things that I think has come out from this COVID period, which was you know, it existed before, but I think people are seeing it for, for everything that it's worth at this point. Uh, one of the things that's come out is that everything is interconnected when it comes to these risks and these opportunities. And I would highly recommend, for example, a wonderful resource, which you may know about, but if you don't, it's the World Economic Forum Global Risks Report that comes out every year. It comes out in January to, to coincide with Davos. And it's a really uh, useful or at least a great snapshot of where global risks are today. And uh, one of the prior speakers, I think from Deloitte, she mentioned how if you look at um, the most likely highest impact uh, potential risks, strategic risks that the World Economic Forum identified this year, five of them, the top five in terms of likelihood were environmental. Uh, and they even identified pandemics right before the pandemic actually happened. So pandemics was number 10, I believe. So the idea there is that uh, they also produce this really great graphic, which I, I've used in my book and I use all the time for presentations where I use a PowerPoint, the interconnectedness of these global strategic risks. And I would say opportunities because when you know your risks, the ESG risks, the ESG and T risks, you can actually put them into your business strategy and develop the tactical approach to um, how are we going to overcome this risk or how are we going to create a product or service that is informed by this risk and allows us to make greater value. Um, and and to, to sort of uh, uh, put this all together, I also think it's really important to think about some of the qualitative things. You know, we talk about quantitative all the time when we talk about ESG and and as I would recommend uh, thinking about technology issues, risks, and opportunities, we need to think about the qualitative aspects of this because not everything can be quantified. Um, and to sort of give another example of a technology piece, um, I recently co-authored a white paper with a good friend of mine, Maya Bunt from Swiss Re. Uh, we we co-authored this for the Swiss Re Institute and it's called Cyber ESG Reporting and then the subtitle was Transparency Imperative or Security Nightmare. And it really brings together this, this, this concept in a specific example, which is cyber. Um, and I think another really important data point that we should all bear in mind and, and probably have read about is in the last few months, the last six, eight months uh, that we have lived through this uh, global crisis, uh, the cyber piece has skyrocketed in terms of cyber attack vectors, cyber incidents, the uh, targeting of hospitals and pharma companies for different reasons by different cyber actors. This is all part of that ESG and T strategic rethink that is businesses, leaders, and other organizations need to think about. We now have the vast majority of people working from home, which has created a whole new 
footprint of attack for those who want to disrupt or want to steal. And um, we know about that from the pharma industry because the pharma industry has been under cyber attack from uh, malign uh, government actors to steal their uh, COVID uh, uh, IP, basically. Uh, we've seen ransomware against hospitals. There was a first case documented, uh, I believe, um, in Germany of a woman who died because of a ransomware incident who was going to go to one hospital, but it was shut down. So she had to be transferred to another for emergency operation, and she died in the process. So this whole uh, area really needs to be th thought of more holistically. And so what I've tried to do uh, through the work that I do with, with my own clients, but also um, just speaking and writing, is uh, try to raise awareness about if you're a, an executive or a, a business person, manager, or board of directors especially, overseeing these things, you have to demand, are you looking at what your most pertinent ESGNT issues are for your business or your organization? Are you incorporating it and integrating it into the strategy of the business? And last but absolutely not least, um, I will point out that this is all part of this larger picture. And I, I believe uh, Bahar mentioned the importance of reputation risk and stakeholders. To me, this all goes back to this concept, again, going from the micro to the macro, the concept of developing stakeholder capitalism, moving from you know, the pure shareholder model to a model that takes into account what are the esg &T issues, expectations, um, uh, rights, uh, obligations that companies have towards their most important stakeholders. So the whole stakeholder universe, whether it's employees, customers, um, uh, suppliers, regulators, et cetera, do you know who they are? Do you know how they will be affected if you don't take care of your esg &T issues? Uh, or do you know how you will create value and opportunity when you do take care of those issues? And it goes back to that whole long-term sustainability, building of resilience, et cetera. So I could go on, I'm like an energizer bunny on this stuff as, as Paul and, and Peter know, but I'll stop because I know we have a few minutes left and I'm not sure if there are any questions, but uh, I'm happy to, uh, to uh, fold, fold my little speech right here. Okay, well, thank you very much, Andrea. Yes, and, and I have a question for you related to the pace of change when, when you and or other people go to write about all of these dynamic technologies that are just accelerating and the pace of change keeps accelerating. And it seems like during the, the pandemic the, the, that pace of change has accelerated at a, at, you know, by another factor. So how, how can investors, how can financial advisors, how can people who are trying to measure all of these issues, how can they keep up with this pace of change? I, I agree that it's it's just a, a incredibly fast. Um, I, I have a mega trend that I identify in one of the chapters of my book that I call um, hurtling through space at the speed of light, and it has to do with tech change. And mm -hmm. I agree that I think the best we can do is be highly informed, highly organized, uh, this is part of the reason why I think expanding the, the ESG lens to include technology is so important because everything we do is affected by technology. And so um, having that broader aperture and taking that into your analysis and taking that into um, your internal policies. If you're, if you're a CEO or you know, a, a board member of a company, are you doing all the right things to create that internal resilience when it comes to ESG and, and T issues? And then the outside uh, you know, stakeholders, the, the financial advisors, the investors, the rating agencies, um, they can see what you're doing. And I'm very much a proponent of transparency. So if you build it, you should show it. But if you haven't built it, you can't claim it. You know, So I think it's really important for uh, all of us to be very um, uh, sort of forthright about building the right pro uh, programs internally that yield the results that we show to the outside world. And one of the big dilemmas that um, we address in the cyber resilience ESG reporting paper that I mentioned is that um, you can't reveal everything when it comes to cyber or you're opening yourself up to vulnerability. That's why uh, the subtitle security nightmare. 
Um, but there are things that you can build internally that show that you have a responsible leadership, you have a responsible oversight, you have tactics and programs that build resilience so that when the crisis happens, you're prepared and you're gonna do so much better for value preservation and value um, uh, building for your stakeholders and your organization than if you weren't prepared. And I think this whole perfect storm that we have here this year uh, really should turbocharge people to getting that done um, because it's not gonna get uh, easier, it's gonna get faster and harder and more complicated. All right, well, we have about a minute left for you to answer this next okay. combination of questions. Are you recommending any solutions to protect ESG investors and advisors and companies from these types of threats? I'm assuming that means the cyber threat. And are there protocols as well as technology solutions? So uh, I'm sure it, you know you could go on about this one for a long time too, and we'll, re we'll reference this person to you, but uh, do you have a quick summary? Of sure. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to have sort of a toolkit uh, of things that you do. You have to have the cyber insurance, but if you want cyber insurance, you need to have the underlying programs. You need to have the structure of a chief information security officer and a, a team, an interdisciplinary team within the organization that's attending to these issues that includes legal and tech and, and senior management and operations. You need to address this stuff seriously. You can't get by with with um, you know, playing around, especially on the cyber issue. Um, there are other things that you can do to create a cyber resilience, like uh, do scenario planning, do exercises, not just at the lower levels of the organization that are dealing with it in the front lines, but at the board level, at the management level. People need to do ongoing exercises and continuous improvement internally. Um, to really create that resilience that I think then investors and the outside kind of stakeholders can look at and say, yeah, this company is doing, you know, more than 80% and they're strong and resilient and we should invest in them or we should rate them higher. Um, I'm, so gonna, are, Andrea, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you there because we've run out of time, but we really okay. appreciate uh, all, the, all the support.